Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm James Lan. I'm the other co-chair for the conference this year. And welcome to plenary number four. Um, we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Paul Keong to come and talk to us. Um, I'm given a difficult task to introduce Paul. It's always hard to introduce someone like him who has done so much. I can spend a whole hour to talk about his scientific accomplishments, about his great mentorship to young faculty, and I won't even do him justice. So I have a surprise for him. Uh, Sam, can you cue the slide? So the concept of transplantation is not new. Uh, it dates back to the beginning of time when there were wars and people were losing their limbs and things. So in this picture, which is a picture from Spain, a painter from there, around 1200, um, he had a picture basically about a, uh, two saints that were fixing limbs for a patient who lost it during the war. And as you can imagine, medical science wasn't great back in the days. So they had a guardian angel looking after those two physicians. And surprisingly how little time has, you know, with time, uh, how little things have changed. You still have a medical nephrologist on the left-hand side, and you have a surgeon on the right-hand side. And as we continue to do things to push the boundary of transplantation, I think what Paul means to our community, he is the silent guardian angel who watches over our back. So I think with that, I'm gonna introduce and welcome Paul to the stage to talk about the Genome Canada program. Welcome, Paul. Well, thank you, James, and it's lovely to be here. And I must say, I, of all the introductions I've ever had, I think that was the sweetest and the nicest. Thank you very much. So today I have an interesting and somewhat challenging task because I have to talk to you about a Genome Canada program which includes half of the important people in the field and yet focuses on the most minute technologies and to speak to a largely clinical audience so that you don't all get bored and go out for coffee. So I'll try and do my best as I go along. And I'm very privileged because I speak on behalf of more than 70 principal scientists, including James and others, from 22 universities around the world in the United States, in Canada, in the European Union, and the UK, and you will see many of their university emblems listed here. It really is a wonderful team, and I'll describe in a little way what each of the groups is doing. Let me start with the problem. The problem is we transplant kidneys, and they fail. And far too many of them fail, and far too many of them fail far too early. And although we had thought for many years this is an act of God, it's something that just happens, people lose their grafts, it's not our fault. In fact, we're beginning to think more and more, actually, there are things that we can do and we should do. So our task for this major genome program was to ask, what are the risks? Can we identify the people who are at the greatest risk? Can we address their problems? And can we utilize or harness the biology that we now know to prevent this loss of grafts? And I'll try and work through these with you. The top picture here shows the story of transplantation. A, graph, a kidney fails for whatever reason, and we replace it with a new transplant. Transplant works beautifully. In fact, in British Columbia, we have a success rate of over 95% at one year, meaning we get useful graft functions, sometimes wonderful function with GFRs up to 60, 70% or more with a single kidney. But over time, those grafts begin to fail and are lost. And the picture on the bottom is a composite modeling process that we developed with Adrian Levy, who used to be here and is now in uh, the eastern provinces, um, who took the United States data and asked, how quickly do grafts fail? And each of the lines on the graphs, the bottom graph, show kidneys that start off with differing degrees of graft function. The top line is those with the best function. So a single kidney should give us an EGFR of about 50%, but in fact, many of those are above that at 60, 65, 70%. Even those, even those kidneys with the very best function, 
less than half of them are surviving at around 10 or 12 years post-transplant. So a terrible tragedy in humanistic terms, in health services terms, in economic terms, something we need to change. So we focused on the major cause of graft gloss, which we used to call chronic rejection, which today we call antibody-mediated rejection. We have a deeper understanding, and I'll work through some of the things that have brought us to this. But that's not really easy to wrestle with, because it's a bit like grabbing water. We don't know how many grafts are lost from this. We just, it's difficult to come to terms with. And if those of you who were at Sean Barber's talk a few minutes ago where he described the tremendous steps in the BCGN registry, you will understand what we've been wrestling with in terms of antibody-mediated rejection. We have to go back through all of the biopsies, recode them, see how many people lost their grafts and come to terms with them. Now, one of the classical markers we have in this to help us on the way is an entity called transplant glomerulopathy. And you see some of the pictures on the right-hand side here, stained with hematoxylinase in acid shift and so others, which really is a result of continuous repeated injury to the endothelium lining the small vessels in the glomerulus. And eventually those cells become damaged, the underlying basement membrane becomes damaged, the glomerulus begins to swell and ceases to function. It's a very classical lesion. You'd think it would be easy to know how often this occurs. I'll show you here a meta-analysis which we've just completed where we started with almost 5,000 articles or hits for references to look at the frequency of this and the impact it had on renal on the outcome of the graft. Out of that, we could only distill about 18, in fact, ultimately 21 articles that gave us the information we needed. But those tell us that if you arrive through antibody-mediated injury to this point, the probability of losing your graft skyrockets and you lose 15 years of useful graft function. Your predicted survival is just over three years versus 20 years if you didn't have the injury. So it's a very important entity that we need to deal with. Now we can try with BC's own data to begin to ask who are the problems? Where do we focus our attention? Because as we know in most diseases, it's 20% of people that gave us the greatest problem. We should invest our time there. Can we do the same here? Interestingly, we have two sets of problems. We have one which focuses on survival of the patient and one which focuses on survival of the graft. Because really what we want is a healthy patient living many years with a successful functioning graft. And because we use powerful immunosuppression, we have the risk of causing the graft to survive, but at the expense of the patient. In a little while, I'll show you how we begin to think in terms of system pharmacology to separate these two, but let me try and lay the groundwork for it. If we think first targeting the BC population for risk, what's the risk of graft of patient death if we look at them, it's first of all on the left-hand side, patients who, who receive a deceased donor graft. Then it's patients who are older. And in the bottom one, it's patients with multiple complications. Stands to reason. A person who's older, receives a deceased donor graft, may have more rejection, more immunosuppression, um, has multiple complications, diabetes and others to start with. The chances are that person will die. Interestingly, that's not necessarily the person who loses their graft. So we need to be very careful of supporting that person. We need to minimize their immunosuppression if we can. If we now look at the people who are going to lose their graft, it's almost entirely the opposite. Yes, it's patients who are deceased donors, but it's patients who are young. And it's young patients who have almost no comorbid diseases. So it's young children and young adults who present to us receiving their very first transplant who then fail. And if we think about this, there are two probably important leading factors. The first is that when we're young, our immune responses are very aggressive. If we think of healing capacity, children get injured, they heal quickly. Older adults heal slowly. Our immune response is exactly the same. The immune response, if we think of it as a spectrum, should be able to respond to every antigen we see. 
But as we get older, we lose components of that response. So I might no longer respond to James or to somebody else. We get what we call holes in our immune repertoire. And our global immune response declines. So now if we conceptualize, we started with one problem, we divide it into two. We must prevent the injury to the graft, but at the same time we safeguard the life and the quality of life of the patients. That's why we brought together this enormous team of about 70 individuals. We have regulatory input, for example, from the FDA, from Health Canada, because we want to translate the things that we succeed in doing quickly to the clinical level so that they can be applied. We have basic scientists working in molecular sciences, in genomics. We have individuals working in animal models. We have many people like James and I working in the lab. We have our clinical colleagues, and together we hope to work through these complex problems. We have four sets of approaches. We think that we understand now from some of the work that's been done in the last decade or two the reasons that grafts reject. We think the risks are definable, and we think they are correctable so that we can largely prevent antibody-mediated rejection. And we would do it on three bases. The first is that we would improve the tissue matching between the donor and recipient so that we minimize the principal cause of rejection, which is HLA disparity. The second is that we would learn to monitor the immune response properly. If I tell you that you wanted to treat hypertension without measuring blood pressure, you'd think it was an impossible task, and it is. Excuse me. But that's exactly what we're doing in transplantation. We're hoping to avoid rejection without the tools to measure the immune response. And the third is an understanding of what we now call systems pharmacology. How do we use the immunosuppressive and other drugs that we have most effectively according to patient need to have the greatest impact with the minimum toxicity? The fourth is perhaps the most important of all of them from today's point of view. And it says, okay, all this sounds very exciting. We may or may not be able to achieve it, but if we do understand the science, Will our clinical colleagues use it? Will our providers in the province allow us to implement it? And will the payers of the province pay for it? So we must demonstrate all of those at the same time. So let me take you now a little bit into the biology and to the genetics. HLA is a set of genes, the most amazing set of genes in the human body. Each gene normally has one or two forms. But the 11 little red genes, which are shown on that snake, which occur in a big length of DNA, there are only 11 of them, between them have 25,000 different forms. They're by far the most complex set of genes anywhere in the human body. And they're developed in order for us to fight infection. They give us a wonderful opportunity and complexity so that we can deal with almost any invader. The side effect, unfortunately, is that we can deal with almost any graft which is, which is implanted. So it's a problem. So what we need to do is find an easier way to reduce this complexity. And the first step we've taken is what we call today epitope biology. So these genes code for proteins which sit on all our cells. And they sweep around the interior of the cells looking for foreign proteins, viral proteins and others. They hold them in the little cleft and they present them out to the T cell. And the T cell comes along and it sees them. And if it recognizes them as self, then it goes away. It's happy, no problem, called tolerance. If it recognizes them as foreign, it proliferates, divides, forms antibodies and begin to attack and destroy the cells. So when we put the transplant in, if it has the foreign antigens recognized by the lymphocytes of the recipient, immediately it becomes destroyed by antibodies and others. But even though we have 25,000 different forms of these molecules, the whole molecule is actually not that important. The molecule is like a hand. And much of the hand we don't care about. It's the same. Our hands probably similar. Our wrists, our forearms, not very different between all of us. It's our fingerprints which are different. And actually it's the same here. And we talk of them now in terms of epitopes. 
And those epitopes are just clusters, a small number of molecules. And you can see them in red on the little uh, helices, the little strings of the HLA molecule. And those are the things we're beginning to talk about now. So just one of these genes, you can see around the top region of the clock, hundreds of different forms of one gene called HLA-B. But down beneath are the epitopes that it caused, codes for, which are much reduced. We reduce the complexity by 60% just by looking at the fingerprints rather than looking at the whole hand. So now we begin to come to a manageable proportion of activity. The interesting thing about these fingerprints as well is that in difference to our fingerprints, they're highly shared. So if we look again at what we call the alleles or the protein molecules, that's the top graph, and none of them is present in more than 50% of us. Most of them are present in 2%, 3%, 1%, 0.01%. .01%. They're quite rare, but if we look at the bottom, you can see the y-axis is 100%. Many of them are present in most of us. So immediately we can see, well, there's a great chance for matching here. Not only that, but if we look at different graphs and we compare donors versus recipients, uh, living donors versus deceased donors, however we want to compare it, the epitopes are of the same frequency in all of them. So we have a really great chance that even though our donors and our recipients vary substantially in ethnic terms and their HLA genes differ, of course, the epitopes are common and are shared and it doesn't matter who it is, the chances you're likely to match. And we can subdivide them into different groups. You see three little levels for each of the top diagram and the bottom diagram. And they are subgroups of those epitopes. So if I belong to the top layer of one of those, the chances are I'll match well with somebody else who is in the top layer or the bottom layer and so on. So it reduces a vastly complex problem of HLA matching to a very, very much simpler problem of epitope matching. So now we have Jenny Tran, who presented some of her data early today, has actually built the world's first population map of epitopes, and it's for BC. And if we just look around the audience today, you can see the enormous ethnic diversity. So if it's manageable in BC, it's manageable virtually everywhere in the world, I think, and her data shows that that's true. So the first task we had to accomplish is to identify the epitopes and how they're spread. We've done that already. The second is to see if we can type for them in time. So let's think first about recipients. You send a recipient to us, we get blood, we do the HLA typing. We do it by sequencing, which is a very advanced, we call it next generation sequencing. It's very advanced technology, but it takes us about three to four days. The problem is we only have about six hours for a donor. So we can't do the same thing. So we have to think of new techniques. So here are three techniques that we're beginning to implement. The first one on the right side shows how many hours it takes. Hmm, we can get very close within four hours. The second one in the middle is even shorter. But the one on which we're beginning to pin great hope now is on the left. We put blood into a little tray. We put it into the little machine you see there. We switch it on. We go away, have a coffee, do our nails, whatever we want to do. Come back, and in two hours, we are very close to having the typing we need. We have a little bit more work to, work to do on it. We're working now with the manufacturers, but we think within another year or so, we will have this technique sufficiently powerful that it will be able to give us the donor typing that we can use for epitope analysis within, as you see there, two hours. That would mean we now have all of the recipients on the wait list typed and sequenced. We know their epitopes. We will now have the donor, each donor that comes in, typed, sequenced, have their epitopes within two years. We could now actually do epitope typing. So we have been debating among ourselves in the lab. We're almost at the position where we could do it today. We are that close that British Columbia could become the very first place essentially worldwide to do true epitope typing. We have a little more work to clean up, but our first task is getting very close to complete. But let me show you something really interesting. I talked about sequencing, and sequencing is, um, it's, it, at the moment it's done with a machine which is like a big oven which already is much, much smaller than the ones that used to be the size of a car or something like that. And it's done in a couple of days. 
But there's a completely new technique where a strand of DNA from you or me or anybody is taken and it's pulled through a little pore, a little hole created by a few molecules in a little sheet of plastic. And as it comes through, each of the DNA bases is coded and it just tells you what it is. You reconstruct them, you know exactly what the sequence is. Today we can do that for 150 DNA bases at a time. The new technology allows us to do it for 1.5 million DNA bases at a time. The sequence is this size. And when you look at the very bottom, you see it attached to an iPhone. And the sequence there is blood was taken from me unknowingly, I must say. It was I knew it was being taken, but I didn't know what it was being used for. I gave a talk. The talk lasted about 45 minutes like this. And at the end, Karen Sherwood came up with my sequence. So it's going to transform everything that we can do, and it's going to do it enormously quickly. So let's move to number two. Let's think of this as measuring blood pressure in the days when we couldn't measure blood pressure. We need to know what the immune response is like post-transplant. What happens? We have very little idea, almost no idea. How do we respond to the donor? How do our T cells react? How quickly do we react? So let's work our way through a little bit. What we've done is we've taken steps in the sequence. We take people before the transplant, and then we take samples during transplant while things are quiet, quiescent, and then we take samples when things are going wrong, when they have rejection. And we measure them in a number of ways. We want to know what are the cells like? How do the lymphocytes react? Are there more? Are there fewer? Are they different populations? And then we want to know uh, how are the genes transcribed? We want to know what other things happened? Are the molecular signals that tell us the rejection is occurring? We're just beginning to get an idea of this. And if I tell you that the story is very much like standing beside a quiet pool on a nice late summer evening, the birds singing, the pool calm, just a few ripples, and someone comes up behind you and throws a big rock in and you get turbulence and waves and all sorts of things, and gradually it settles down. That's exactly what happens in transplantation. And it happens over the first few weeks after the transplant, then peace returns. And here you see some pictures of different cell populations post-transplant, where because we give immunosuppression, then cell populations are driven down, and then there's turbulence, depending on how they respond, maybe with a little bit of early recognition of the donor, and then they become quiescent and settle down. Now, if people are doing well, they should stay like that. It's when people have rejection that that, quiesce, that turbulence returns and we run into difficulties. But how do we get this data? We get this data through, you remember I told you about next generation sequencing. Now we use next generation phenotyping. We use very sophisticated flow cytometers that have multiple channels. Uh, 15, 21 channels. And each of them can measure many, many parameters. So we have hundreds, thousands of data points on any given patient at any given time. You can see some of the pictures we develop as we begin to interpret the data. There's no way we can carry it in our mind. There's no way we can translate it to you. What we want to do is present it in an easy to remember format so you can say, yes, I see the change immediately in patient X. So what we're beginning to do is use artificial intelligence to do this. Instead of showing you Hundreds of numbers, we try to create a picture. The picture on the left is one we put together, and each of those six colors represents a different population of lymphoid cells or immune cells. Then we feed the information into our artificial intelligence strata, and we ask, can you cre recreate it? The picture on the right is the picture that the machine recreates, but it's even better than us, because it's added three extra subsets of cells which when we look back, we actually say, yes, they really were there. We just didn't interpret them ourselves. So we're getting to the point where we will be able to create pictures that will convey lots of information. And by now increasing the depth of the artificial intelligence approaches, we can actually get the intensity of the expression of the markers on the surface of these cells, not just the types of cells, but how radiant they are with all of the markers, which is another index of rejection. So the darker the color, the more intense the expression of these immune markers on their surface. We know that genes become activated during this time, and we're just beginning to look at the sequence of gene expression after transplantation. We know it's very turbulent. Some genes are down-regulated, as you see in the orange diagram. Others are up-regulated, which I haven't shown to you. 
but the most interesting story is on the left side with the two circles. And in the middle of each of those circles is what we call a master gene. And that master gene switches on or off tens to hundreds of other genes. And the hope now is that if we can adjust the expression of that master gene, we can reactivate those genes which need to be activated for our immune defense and health and switch off those that need to be quiet to avoid rejection. We can go a little bit further. We can think, how do we respond to the foreign, foreign antigens on the kidney that's transplanted? Well, the cells that respond are what we call T lymphocytes. So the kidney holds out its foreign HLA antigen and a T lymphocyte comes along and it recognizes it as foreign. If you look at the colorful picture on the top right, you'll see there's a blue or a purplish molecule, that's the T cell receptor, recognizing an orange molecule, which is the HLA. The interesting feature is every lymphocyte in our body only has one T cell receptor. So all of our T cells respond to different antigens. It's as though I had one T cell that responds to James and one that responds to a deer and one responds to something else. But when those cells become activated, they proliferate and create thousands or millions of daughter cells. So if we had a way of tracking the number of those cells, we could see whether that clone is expanding to attack the target. So we can do this now because we can look at that T cell receptor, we can take its genetic sequence, and we can ask how many copies of that sequence are measured in peripheral blood. If it's a few, we don't care. Everything's quiet, everything is good. If there are thousands, we become concerned. If there are tens of thousands or millions, whoops, we have a real problem, we need to intervene right away. So this may be the very first and the very most specific test of immune recognition that we can develop. Now, many of you will have received reports from us saying Mrs. Smith has antibodies to this antigen or has this degree of CPRA, and I'm here to tell you that please bear it with some concern at the moment because we're in a process of health technology assessment that we never thought we would have to approach. So we started with a kit which is a in technical terms, a wonderful step forward. It puts a different antigen onto each of a hundred little beads, and then we can add blood or serum to it, and we can see if the antibodies recognize that specific antigen. That's an enormous breakthrough. The problem is the initial kit that we tested, and we still use very, very widely, has what we call hot beads. Some just react when they shouldn't. So what it means is we overinterpret people's antibodies has two consequences. One is a person may be prevented from receiving a graft because we falsely perhaps believe the person has antibodies to that donor. In other words, we do a virtual cross match and we may say, sorry, Mrs. Smith has antibodies to your donor, may actually not be correct. That's a, an issue which James is beginning to look at in a new international grant now that we're just putting forward. That will be very important. The second is, after transplant, if the creatinine clearance falls, you think there may be rejection, you send us blood, we send a response back saying, yes, we think there are antibodies to this particular antigen on Mrs. Smith. It may not be the case. You may start intensive immunosuppression. If it's an older person, it may be exactly the thing that they, we don't need. So we're now engaged in a major initiative to look at different technologies to sort this out. On the little uh, diagram with all the dots, one, the x-axis is one kit, the y-axis is another. If they recorded the same thing, there should be a clear line between the two and all the dots should be along the line. You can see they're all over the shop. So along the bottom axis, there are some patients who are very positive on one test and negative on another. And the vertical axis, there are patients who are positive on test B and negative on test A. That can't be. There's just no way that that can be right. But what we have found is that this is not the test that's causing the problem, I should say, at least not exclusively the tests. The patients who fall to one side or another are discrete patients. And as I've started saying now, the patient is the problem. There is something special in the blood of these patients that causes to react, them to react to test A or to test B when in fact the test should be negative. And now we're working to decipher these and we need to do this quickly because we use this daily as a clinical test. 
We would like to have a very simple method for detecting when the graft is injured before the creatinine clearance starts to change. And we're hoping that by looking for the DNA of the donor floating in the blood, uh, donor-derived DNA, cell-free DNA, it will give us a very quick index of very, very subtle degrees of injury. We have those studies underway now, and our partners have already shown this looks to be the case. So let me then turn quickly to systems pharmacology. Systems pharmacology means using the treatments we have in the best possible way. And it's a combination of pharmacogenetics, pharmacodynamics, and pharmacokinetics. We have all of the three different components, but we've never put them together before. We can now begin to look for those individuals who genetically would be encoded to respond to treatment drug A and B, or those to A and C or different combinations, and we already know most of the genes that are involved. And this is why I mentioned in the very beginning the two kinds of risks for patient death and graft loss. We need to know, first of all, can we transplant everybody? So there are questions at the very start of assessing pre-transplant risk. I told you some of them. The older patient with multiple comorbidities most likely to die. The younger patient with no, com no comorbidities most likely to lose their graft. So lose their graft is the top line, die is the bottom line. So we can begin to combine now pharmacogenetic risk, pharmacokinetic measurements, meaning concentrations of the blood, pharmacodynamics, meaning how does that drug work on my cells as opposed to your cells, and we can begin to look at different things. For the bottom one, we want to minimize safely the amount of immunosuppression we give, because us older people don't tolerate immunosuppression as well as younger guys. So we need to be very gentle with us. We want to minimize it, but minimize it safely, because we know if we just reduce immunosuppression, we will lose the graft. And for the individuals at risk, for example, the children from the sick kids, and, uh, or children from BC, uh, children's and from other young adults, they're the ones who are at the greatest risk of losing the graft. So we need to intelligently improve and augment their immunosuppression. James will show you probably tomorrow some of his really, I think, groundbreaking studies that show if we just look at people who reduce their immunosuppression, a lot of them do. 60% have that one drug, mycophenolate reduced, and they're the ones who lose their grafts. This is just a very simple one. Now, if we break it down more according to risks, we'll find it's even more important. And he's going to discuss with you, I'm sure, some of the new studies he's proposing for sequential adaptive clinical trials using small groups of patients in a completely novel way, borrowed from the field of oncology, to try and lead us through to the appropriate use of drugs. And combined with that, we will then begin to be able to move into the field of tolerance, where we'll use mini bone marrow transplantation in combination with renal transplantation to induce long-term tolerance, and these will be exactly those kind of small, adaptive, sequential clinical trials. So let me close just with the issue relating to, is all of this worth it, and will it be economically viable, and most importantly, will our patients feel that this is a benefit to them? Because if we move to this new strategy, it will mean that we move away from today's selection process, which is essentially first come, first served. So very largely, the next people on the waiting list are going to be the next people transplanted within certain limits. But the new approach would mean we would like to adjust them based upon how well you match because we think it will offer you the chance for a better outcome. But we need to demonstrate this and we need to explain it very carefully. And we need to be sure that as we put this forward, we have engagement and buy-in and acceptance from everybody from the patients, most importantly, because it affects them directly, from the physicians, because they will be the ones employing this approach, and from the health providers who will have to say, yes, we recognize post-transplant monitoring is now a new and important field. It will cost us, but we are going to have to pay for it if we want success. So our goal is really that we will arrive at a point soon, we hope, I would love to say within my career, but certainly within James's career, where we transplant a kidney and we have a realistic opportunity that that kidney will survive for the lifetime of the patient with no rejection. And if we can do that for kidneys, we can do it for hearts, livers, lungs, bone marrow. So it will revolutionize the whole field of transplantation. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Paul, for, uh, as always, a very elegant and exciting talk. Um, we have about um, 10 minutes for, for questions. There's microphones. If you're shy, you can uh, type them into the, uh, the app, and then I'm going to read it out loud for Paul. So maybe I'm going to start with one first, Paul. Um, so um, when we go towards the era of epitope matching, um, there may be some patients of a smaller minority that feel like, are they going to get left out because they have an uncommon genotype? For instance, my, my niece is a, a child of an interracial ma marriage, and um, there, there may be some patients thinking that they, they may be difficult to match um, in, in this type of a, um, approach. So a really important question. We've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and we're actually doing very extensive modeling on it now. So I mentioned many of the groups that are involved, are groups in the United States, and group particularly in McGill with very strong computational modeling skills, is actually modeling this now using the BC data. If we were matching for HLA, as we used to think about years ago, I would say yes because Chinese distribution of HLA antigens is different from Caucasian, is different from Vietnamese, there's no question. But actually, as I showed, the epitopes are similar. We all share the similar epitopes. We all have five fingers, no matter the color of our skin. So it won't necessarily jeopardize people ethnically. What it will do is mean we have to change our thinking to say, if I was number three on the list and due to get a transplant, likely next week, I may not be number three on the list anymore. I may get a transplant in the next few months or six months or a year. But if I do, the chance of me keeping that for my lifetime is very much better than if I rushed and got anyone tomorrow. So that's the conversation we need to have. Anyone else? Go ahead. You want me to find a microphone? You can shout. Okay, I'll yell. Um, so I'm interested in sort of the complexity of trying to add into that um, age. Because um, as you say, you want the graph to last the lifetime of the patient. Mm -hmm. The patient's conceivable lifetime is 10 years. Um, does, that, does that weigh into the mix of how much the matching should be? And also, in those older patients, if they have more probability of tolerance, does that also weigh into your decision on who gets the graft? A really interesting question. So the simple answer is yes but you probably want a bit more. Hmm? So the people who have a predicted survival of five or 10 years are not the young kids, they're the older guys, the people with multiple comorbidities. And as we saw, they're the ones who are most likely to die and not lose their graft. As we get older, our immune response weakens, and so the question is, how do we most successfully minimize immunosuppression and keep that person alive? So it may be that we don't have to worry too much about very close matching for the older population because they're likely not going to reject anyway. We may have more flexibility with them. And we may want to just monitor them carefully and adjust their immunosuppression. Whereas the younger individuals, we need to be very aggressive in making sure they have the best match graft because they're the ones who have to keep their kidneys now for 50 years. We already have, I don't know if everybody knows, kidney graft survival at the 50 year mark, which is stunning, with creatinines of 85. If we could do that by careful selection for everybody, that would be, I'd be very happy to leave the rest of the work to James then. Maybe to follow up on this question, as we move into the era of precision medicine, a lot of input that we as um, healthcare providers, we need input from patients um, to, to find the optimal uh, match between what they expect and what we can provide. Um, is Genome, how is Genome Canada taking the steps to engage patients in that regard? Thank you, James. That's a wonderful intro. So they have recommended that we develop a process of deliberative democracy which we've chatted about before, Adira, and which we're very keen to get going. It's taken us a long time to get everybody marshaled and all of these. The problem with 70 investigators is even though they're wonderful, it's like herding cats. You've got to get everybody moving in the same direction. But everybody is now key. So what we would do is begin to bring together groups of patients, groups of physicians, groups of the public who don't have renal disease so we can get their view as well, representatives from paying agencies, representatives from providers. We would begin to lay out the schema that we think will be the solution to 
an important solution to renal transplantation and lay out for them as well the costs and consequences. And then we want to get their feedback. We're hopeful if we can show the success that we see coming now, if we can demonstrate that to them, that people will agree, yes, it, this is the next step we take. That we take it in an experimental approach. We say, okay, for the next X years, this is the approach we take, and this is how we do it, and this is how we follow the data. And we confirm that that's the case. And if it's true, that will be the norm. So Genome Canada is very keen to see us move in this direction. We've had all of the conversations I think we need within the group. So the next step is to begin to meet formally, to begin to put the groups into place, begin to select the people who would like to be involved. We would love you all to be involved, to begin those com the conversations and see if we can arrive at a consensus between us as to how we move in the next step. No, that's unusual, Sunit. <laughs> um, Genome Canada, I mean, obviously we're not the only area that's going to precision medicine. I mean, oncology, as you mentioned yeah. earlier, is ahead of us in many ways. They have pathology, they get the genetics, they decide which drugs to give patients, et cetera. Cancer is a stronger buzzword within all communities yep. than compared to, compared to renal disease or dialysis. Does Genome Canada, which might be involved in many other of those areas of precision medicine, have some plan as to how it's going to prioritize when it meets with the providers, et cetera, amongst those areas? So a really good question because many people will not know Genome Canada. Genome Canada is a big funding agency. It's like the Canadian Institutes for Health or the NIH. And while it has an overall plan for precision medicine, it would like to see it move in this direction. It leaves it very much up to an open grant competition and then people put in the submissions that you think are important. It selects the ones it think are important and then it says, okay, we've given you your money for the next five years. It's up to you to do this. So. In many ways, cancer has been ahead of us because they've been able to genotype their tumors and look at treatments that would be related to them. But one of the big differences with our approach is we're working on a truly public health approach for application of genome medicine. In BC, the cancer agency is doing that, but in most areas, that's not the case. It's just a question of local treatment of whoever has that genetic malformation. Whereas for us, we're saying Canada could move to this for renal transplantation as a country. So Genome Canada is very encouraged by this approach. They see the, we've heard so many talks here about the strength of BC in the, based in its data, based in its integration, based in its collaborativeness in the field of renal failure. They're very aware of this and they think if we could develop this across Canada with the input of others, it would be a wonderful success. So I think that's probably the simplest approach I can give. So maybe one last question here from the uh, from the app. Um, the audience asks: uh, Is stem cell to produce a human kidney um, um, ongoing, and um, uh, is that a possible reality in the future? Yes. So the answer is yes. Stem cell biology is moving forward so quickly, and we already have systems developed in a number of universities where we can take an organ, particularly the heart, we can strip all of the cells out of the heart, and it leaves almost a silk stocking of a heart. It's a framework of fibrous tissue which looks like the heart but has no cells. It's just an empty little sack of silk. And then you can repopulate it with stem cells from the person's own body. You can't do that quickly, but you can do it. So we now see the way forward. It's likely that the first organ will be the heart because the heart, though important, is simply a pump. It has one real major function. And so you can repopulate it with a limited number of cells and it will grow that way. Kidney is a much more complex organ, as is the liver, so it will take much more time to redevelop the heart with, redevelop the kidney with stem cell biology and 3D printing. It will come, but, but probably not quickly for enough, enough for us to avoid these approaches. And even when we repopulate, it's not to say that the cells won't be transformed in some way when we reimplant them, so that what we call hidden antigens will now be exposed. When we, when we, when we grow cells, the, cells the, the structure of molecules on the surface changed. And it could be that new molecules are exposed to which we're not tolerant, and we still may need some form of immune modulation to deal with them. So I'm very hopeful that artificial organs will come from stem biology. will be a little time. I'm not putting my next grant in on it. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Very welcome.